morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being with us today. Be very welcome to the first workshop about the European Care Strategy. We are live from Brussels in Belgium, and the first topic of this morning will be tapping into the potential of the care economy. So as you can see around me, we have great experts who are, are with us today. They will share their views, their analysis, their experience. How are you doing, guys? Is everything okay for you? Yeah? Ready to start? Yeah? Okay, good. If, if, if I can help you in any way, feel free to tell me, all right? And whatever happens, I will cover you, okay? So don't feel embarrassed. I will be there to help in any situation. And we are also very lucky to have Katarina uh, Ivankovic nezevich Hi, Katarina. How are you doing today? Fine. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will get back to you in a few seconds. But first, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you some practical information. If you have any comment to share about uh, what we're going to uh, explain and share together, feel very free to use the hashtag EU Social Forum. If you have any question that you would like to ask to one of our experts, that will be very easy for the people in the room. You just have to raise your hand in the Q&A session that will be at the end of the session. And the people online, you just have to uh, post your question on Slido. So what is Slido? Well, very easy. Slido is an interactive tool that we are going to use for you to ask some questions, for the people online to ask some questions, but also for everybody, uh, for us to ask some questions to everybody. So how uh, is it possible to get connected to Slido? This is very easy. Ladies and gentlemen, you just have to grab your smartphone, then you will see a QR code on the screen. You just have to scan the QR code and you will be immediately uh, connected to Slido to the questions and to the polls. So what I propose to do is to start right now with the first question. So ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see the uh, QR code on the screen. And the first question is this one. Are you a caregiver in your family or professionally? So you have a few seconds to scan the QR code to think about the question, I'm going to repeat it. I see that everybody is scanning on the room. So people online, you just have to do exactly the same thing. That's Scan the QR code. And That's I repeat the question, right. are you a caregiver in your family or professionally? This is very easy. It's a choice between yes or no. Yeah, it, it's going to work. Don't worry. Look at this. Oh, cool. Yes. So you can probably see that the answers are still moving a little bit because I told you we are live. All right. So if it's still moving a little bit, don't worry. This is totally normal. We can see, for example, right now that we have more or less, let's say, 70% uh, of the people who are not caregivers and a little bit more than 30, 32 percent now. Oh, it's growing again. 34 percent of the people who are caregivers. Very interesting to know. It's still moving again. So now we have 36 uh, percent of the people who are caregivers. What I propose to do is to go to the next question. There is another question. Now, same process. You, uh, still, you are still connected to Slido. Here is the question. Does someone in your family need care? Mm. So let me repeat the question, very easy. Once again, yes or no. Does someone in your family need care? And we see right now that we have a large, a huge majority of people online and in the room who uh, has someone in the family needed for care. 76% of the people, and I'm concerned too, I don't know about you, well, yeah, yeah, we all have probably someone who needs care. It can be a light care or a heavier, a heavier care. That's very important uh, for us and for you, dear uh, speakers and experts, to consider this. So now it's about 76% of the people who have someone in their family who need care. 
So thank you very much for that. Uh, what I propose to do is to share now, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very important information. So please be very focused because I would like to tell you something very important. One day or another, all the people in this room, all the people behind the screens, all of us, we will need help. Yes, there is absolutely no doubt about that. Whatever happens, we will all need some people to take care of us. So it can be, as I said, a light help or maybe a nevier help, but whatever happens, we will all need help and care services. This is a fact. So, Katarina, I would like to have your feedback on this. Regarding that situation, could you please tell us um, what are we going to do today here? What are the main goals of this first workshop? And what are we going to talk about, Katarina? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, and good morning to all here in person and, and online all around EU, I guess. Uh, and Alan, you have really rightly pointed out, and we have seen it in the Slido, that care indeed concerns us all. And when I say care, we can speak about the, the child care. We were all children once. We are fortunate maybe to have children. Uh, we have elderly parents, grandparents, or we have we are living with a person with disabilities or with a person who needs care and that was i would dare to say a starting point of the care strategy and that care indeed uh, concerns everyone we all need it at in some point uh, uh, in our lives uh, we also provide care and i think the slido wasn't really doing the right because we all have provided, I'm sure we have provided care for someone, if not for children or parents, grandparents, for a friend. I think we have seen it in a COVID that it was really something where we all have faced uh, the need to reflect and to, to be in a way caregivers. Some of us took it as a profession. There are professional carers working in a formal care and many, many are I would dare to say, working as informal carers across the globe. Um, it is due to various uh, aspects. It's due to the demographic challenges. The age and life expectancy is increasing, which is a great thing, and which also creates a demand for, for uh, care services, and it also uh, creates demand for uh, different care services. Uh, the care strategy uh, is set uh, to really improve the situation of both strands, of the carers, but also of those who are the care receivers and who need care. And when it comes to how we can do it, first of all, we need to reflect on the services. The services need to be of a good quality. They need to be affordable. They need to be accessible. And I'm very happy that in our documents that we have recently adopted, and one of them is the care strategy, which covers both child care and the long-term care. And then we have a two recommendation that also cover both, uh, both topics. But I would like to say that the recommendation on the high quality, affordable long-term care, which is just about to be agreed and adopted in the Council, and we are all keeping our fingers crossed for the December uh, uh, when this important document will be fully in, in the motion and member states will have to react. But also in, this, in the recommendation, we have uh, uh, addressed other challenges which are very important, especially for the carers. This, these are the working conditions, uh, this is skills and upskilling and reskilling and everything related to the proper skills. And the third is how to strike the good work-life balance, especially for informal carers, I would dare to say. We also see it as a huge job creation potential. The figures show that today in Europe, 9 million people are working in the care industry, in the care sector, let's say. 
and by 2050 there will be need for additional 1.6 million jobs. I think it's a huge potential, it's a huge, a huge economic uh, growth could be boosted because all of these uh, uh, jobs will pay in additional taxes, additional social security and in a way uh, uh, they will practically pay themselves which is something that we have to also take into calculation when we are reflecting on the jobs. So, to, put, to, to wrap it up uh, quickly, in the recommendation we work for fair working conditions first, for skills, addressing skills needs and also addressing skills shortages. How do we see uh, uh, and who can do it? Of course, the member states within their own national systems, but they cannot do, do it alone. That's why we have put a very uh, important accent to the social dialogue. And I'm very happy that today we, in, in this panel we have uh, the representatives of different sectors and also also of the social partners and this is very important and also including those who are the main stakeholders in the care which is not only public or private companies but also civil society also other stakeholders who can really boost what we still lack is a bit um, information, data, data sharing, and this is something that we have included in the care strategy, that it is very important okay. to see the framework, to be able to compare, to see what is missing, and if I can take like two things from the, care, uh, from, from the recommendation, first uh, uh, um, achievement is that care, long-term care is fully embedded in the social protection systems, which will address the challenge of affordability, accessibility and coverage. And then the second is that we have managed to introduce the quality principles for all care settings. And this is very important and this is, I believe, something that was so visible in COVID, how difficult it was to, to make sure that care, long-term care uh, institutions continue working and that they have a good contingency planning in the times of crisis. So today I really, I am a bit more in a quiet mode after, after this short presentation. I'm very much looking forward to listen to what colleagues have to say and, and I'll be happy also to respond to any question. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, dear experts, I have, also, of course, also uh, some questions for you. But the first question is, who are you, actually? And so I'm going to introduce you very quickly. Sylvain, Sylvain Renouvel, uh, thanks for being with us today. You are a director at the Federation of European Social Employers. Is that correct, Sylvain? That's correct. OK, thank you. Oof, that's fine. Uh, Jan, Jan Willem uh, Kondrian, you are a general secretary at the European Public Public Service Union. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, to be with us today. Jenny, Jenny Wada, you come from Sweden, isn't it? Yes, be right. very welcome in Belgium. Uh, you are a Deputy Director to the Ministries of Health and Social Affairs. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, Shidi, Shidi King, Mrs. King, thank you very much to be with us too. You are uh, Chief of Gender uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Branch at the International Labour Organization. Mm -hmm. That's correct too? That's correct. Okay, great, very good. So uh, one last word for you uh, guys. You don't have to agree about everything, all right? It means that you can have your opinion, and that's fine. Of course, it's not about fighting. It's about changing, uh, uh, sharing, and, uh, and uh, sharing your experience. But feel free to express yourself. And I would like to start with you, Sylvain. Uh, I have a question for you about the attractiveness of care jobs. So could you tell us, Sylvain, in a few minutes, what can employers do in a concrete way to improve the attractiveness of the care jobs and how can social dialogue help improve the situation of care workers? 
Thanks for the question and first, first for the uh, thank you for the invitation from the Commission. And um, yes, in, indeed, um, we, we social partners, uh, not, not only employers, employers and trade unions can do things together uh, to improve working conditions in social services. And uh, we will see uh, that we are quite in line with the Commission in the care strategy because I will take many points that, that have been highlighted by Katarina before. Uh, I would say um, we have a prerequisite is the question of funding. Uh, the, um, be, be, uh, since the, um, the crisis of 2008, uh, the key word uh, in social services in public policies was cuts. So, uh, and we saw the consequences in the COVID crisis. We were in a weak situation to face this crisis. So today I, I will take uh, a key word from the strategy is the need to invest in social services and in social care workforce. That's the, the obvious thing. <coughs> Once we have this investment, and the ball is in the side of the uh, member states, because the care strategy is a good document, but the challenge is to have it implemented in member states and uh, once we have this investment what we can do together first of course uh, the first task of uh, everywhere uh, about social partners we negotiate wages because everybody knows that wages in the social services are weak Eurofound showed uh, in 2008 that it was uh, below uh, the average wages for all the sectors below of 21 percent less yeah. uh, it means and often more often than the other sectors part-time working so it means uh, you many people working in social services are working poor and they care of people in a weak situation in vulnerable, vulnerable groups and they are themselves vulnerable. So that's, that's a challenge. So of course, this first point is obvious. That's also uh, one of the main reasons of the lack of attractiveness of social services. It's not enough paid. So we, have, we can improve uh, this situation, not at EU level, because it's not a competence of a social dialog at EU level, but at national level, social partners should have some envelopes from the governments, from the local authorities, to have the mean to improve the wages and to negotiate new wages, and also, more broadly, collective agreements for, uh, for workers in the sectors. And for this, there's also a challenge, the fact in almost half of European countries, there are no employers' um, organizations in social services. So there are trade unions most of the time, but no, nobody to discuss with in front of them. So that's also a challenge why uh, we work together with IPSU and national partners to build the capacity uh, of organizations as well orga employers and uh, employees organizations to build their capacity to have a proper social dialogue in the next years. So that's the first point. Second point, uh, not just because we saw uh, free risk of accidents in the room <laughs> just at the beginning, uh, the working conditions broadly, uh, and uh, our sector is now proved as uh, a very not dangerous sector, but a sector where uh, the working conditions and the risk of accidents on occupational disease is quite high. It is one of uh, among the, the most uh, dangerous sectors. It's comparable to the, uh, the, the construction industry. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is a, some services. But you have to handle people, you have to help people on your yeah. back pain. Many people, the main risk is musculoskeletal disorders, your back pain, everything about the skeleton, and that's huge. So we have uh, to, to work on, the, on, on this topic, and uh, that's key, of course, but we have also to think broader about working conditions, Generally, uh, working condition is not only not, uh, not having accident, not having uh, occupational disease, it's also have good working conditions, uh, well-being at work, have gender equality, have uh, work-life balance, and uh, also supporting management. So many things to work on to improve the situation. That's also something we do together between social partners at EU level and with partners at national one. My third point is about, uh, as uh, also uh, Katarina has mentioned, the question of training on career paths. Uh, we have to train many workers. Katarina told it, 1.6 million to, uh, of workers to welcome in the services. We have to train them so we, and to qualify them in order to, because uh, care jobs are qualified jobs. It has to be known. It's not something you can do like that. Huh? Sure. You have to be trained for us. And we are also have to, so to welcome the new ones and train them and also 
to upskill uh, the existing ones, well, the current ones, because the needs of the users are changing today. Uh, the, the, the users of services uh, request uh, more person-centered support within the community, not something one size fits all in a, in a residential setting. They want things fit to them, themselves. So there's a change of mindset to, to, to make in the mind of uh, current social workers so that they change the way they work uh, to support better the people. And so that's something, uh, and also not an anecdote, uh, CDFOP, so the Agency for Skills at EU level, uh, when you check uh, one of their, their, their studies, which is about uh, the competencies and skills uh, needed in the advertisements uh, online and so on, they, we, you can see there that in social services, what is the most demanded in, in terms of skills is uh, adaptation to change. So oh, yeah. that's, uh, that's not an anecdote, that means in real, also in real life, that's what people say. People have to change their mindset and to, to be more adapted to the needs. So, and uh, but, uh, we just started yesterday with our colleague from EPSU, also a, a study about this topic, about the, the, the new needs of the users, and in front of this, what are the new skills needed from the workers? And I think that will be a good point. The fact that 2023 has been announced as the year of skills, I think it will, be, it will help us to put this topic at the top of the agenda uh, next year. So that, that's uh, very positive. Okay. So to summarize, uh, I would say once we have uh, sufficient funding in social services, satisfying uh, funding, we will be able to negotiate better wages that may, will make the jobs more attractive, to improve the working conditions, because I didn't mention it, there's also the questions of staff users ratios. We have to have enough people to care of people. And uh, last thing, to invest in uh, training for staff to offer them also new careers and opportunities to grow. Uh, so, uh, and all of this, it's not just for pleasure, it's to, to be able to provide better quality services and better jobs for everybody. Okay, thank you very much, Silva. Uh, uh, improving ability of change, that's very interesting because I think that we are a uh, lot of people who should maybe do that, uh, probably a little bit more uh, improving ability of change. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Jan, I have a question for you too, of course. Uh, so let me remember that you are a General Secretary of the European Public Service Union. Jan, um, what can trade unions do to improve the quality of the care jobs? And I would like to ask you, do you agree with Sylvain about the social dialogue and how the social dialogue can uh, improve the situation and encourage maybe public investment in the care sector? Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and also the folks who are uh, looking online uh, to us. As you could understand, almost the first part of what Sylvain was saying about collective bargaining, social dialogue, there's a lot uh, with what we uh, agree with. That doesn't mean that we, don't all, that we don't sometimes have differences of opinion. I was yesterday at a strike here in uh, Brussels uh, with the social workers of the Brussels Social Services, uh, uh, and they were complaining about some of the issues uh, Sylvain addressed. Lack of staff. Lack of staff because they can't cope with the enormous workload, uh, the files they have to do. And because there are too few staff, that leads to aggression of the people they have to take care of. Uh, so third-party violence is a, big, uh, is a big issue, something we also, uh, we also discuss. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we uh, always agree, but in general lines, we know what the solutions are and what we need to address as employers and trade unions. Social dialogue has been proven also in the pandemic uh, to be one of the tools to address many of the challenges we face. I mean, we think the pandemic is a public health issue, but it was, fer was very much also a workplace issue, a health and safety uh, issue at the workplace, and unions and employers were able to negotiate safety protocols uh, and, and other issues uh, which came up. Uh, so social dialogue is very important. Collective bargaining, ensuring that workers are covered and protected by uh, a collective agreement, uh, which settles a whole range of things, and which is a flexible tool, and uh, Sylvain alluded to that, is a flexible tool to also play into the needs of the sector. One of the things as employers and unions we address is continuous professional development and training, uh, another point uh, which was mentioned. Um, um, 
health and safety was, uh, was addressed. But the big challenge for the sector is the challenge of funding, public funding. Yeah? And it's not sometimes you hear about investment and when we talk about the recovery and resilience fund, uh, there's sometimes a lot of money available for investment. And it's nice to build a new home, but as Sylvain mentioned as well, if you don't have uh, the people and the qualified people to fill that home, to take care of the people you want to um, uh, house in the home or provide service to in, in the facility, I mean, it doesn't shoot, uh, shoot, shoot anybody. Uh, so one of the big challenges in Europe, and that's in the health sector, but certainly also in the social care sector, is the lack of staff, the lack of qualified staff. Uh, and it's not something uh, you, can, uh, you cannot train people uh, from one day to the next. I mean, this requires long-term training, long-term commitment, long-term funding uh, in, uh, in the sector. You asked for a bit of a controversial point. Well, I'll bring you one from our perspective. Actually, not so much with the employers uh, uh, here, but more with the Commission. And the Commission, I mean, is the boogeyman uh, you can always step on. No, uh, I know that. Uh, so uh, I also know the Commission will not take that personal. In the long-term care strategy, there's actually two points and, uh, on the long-term care strategy. One in which we disagree with, with the Commission and one we agree with with the Commission and disagree with, with the Member States. What we disagree with with the Commission is that we find there's too much attention for private investment in care. We don't think that is the way and private investment in care doesn't come without guarantees for the private investors. Many of you have followed the scandal in France, in Orpea, uh, and what is going on there. And what is happening is that the state now uh, might have to step in, public finance, to save the services for the elderly in France. And why is that? Because care is a public service, provided through a municipality or provided to um, uh, non-for-profit uh, organizations, charities, churches, etc. But it is a public service, not something on what you want to make and should make money. The Commission is too much on private investment and we don't see where that private investment is coming from. The other point where we, uh, Very do, quickly, Jan, please. Yeah, where we do agree with the Commission and where we disagree with the Member States is the long-term care strategy actually asks the Member States to make an action plan uh, and to come forward with how they want to improve long-term care. And we understand the Member States are watering this down, uh, and this is a point we disagree with. Uh, it would be much better if, uh, if there's much more punch uh, to it. Uh, so that's certainly a point we do agree with, with the Commission. Thank you very much, Jan. I, I saw that Katarina wrote down and took some notes. So it's, it's written and it's said. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Wada, once again, welcome, uh, welcome in Belgium. Uh, we know Sweden has a well-developed care system. We know that. And uh, we, we would like to know a little bit more about that. How does the situation look like exactly in Sweden? And uh, what, what concrete action does Sweden take to improve the attractiveness of the care sector? Please give us some clues. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is important questions and very urgent in Sweden as well. Uh, as I think, in most of Europe, the population in Sweden is aging, and we share the challenges of lack of staff in the care sector, especially in the elderly care, which is the sector that includes the largest professional groups in Sweden, assistant nurses and care assistants. Uh, in Sweden, the municipalities have a statutory duty to provide care and service for the elderly, and the county councils are... Um, responsible for the provision of health and medical care. And the legislation of the social services and health care allows the municipalities and the county councils a great deal of freedom to organize and plan their own services and levy taxes to finance them. And the new recruitment of assistant nurses and care assistants is a challenge in the care sector. Therefore, a good uh, working life and a long working life is an important health factor at the same time as it is essential for the long-term funding of the Swedish welfare systems through the taxes. So how does the Swedish government support the municipalities and the county councils uh, in this challenge? Uh, since the social partners are strong and equal, both in the representation and the coverage of collective agreements are high, the state is able to step back 
uh, and let the social partners take responsibility for the wage formation and other. The Swedish labor law legislation is a kind of framework for the social partners. The main characteristics of the law is that so it's a social protective legislation regulating a decent working environment, working time of eight hours a day, and the right to five weeks paid vacation every year. Through the collective agreements, the social partners adapt the regulation to the special needs and circumstances to different sectors. So, instead, the Swedish government has taken several measures to increase the attractiveness of the sector, and I will give you three examples. First, as from the 1st of July in 2023, the professional title of assistant nurse is protected by law. Only a person who has a certificate issued by the National Board of Health and Welfare will have the right to use the title assistant nurse. The purpose of this is to highlight that the skills of assistant nurses are important to ensure quality and security in health and care. And second, in 2020, the government decided on a grant to finance staff to increase their competence in elderly care, for instance, to train us to become an assistant nurse. And the target group also include frontline managers. And last but not least, uh, the government uh, intends to inquire how a language requirement for staff in elderly care could be implemented. Today, there are shortcomings in terms of the staff linguistic competence, uh, and elderly people should feel safe with the care and attention given, and part of it is to understand the staff and to be understood, and of course, um, ensure that the staff can share necessary information with each other. This was um, a problem during the pandemic. Um, and these are the few examples on how the Swedish government works on a national level to meet the challenges in the care sector. Thank you very much. And very inspiring uh, concrete decisions yeah. that are taken. This is, this is key, probably. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. King, uh, Shidi King, uh, you're from International Labour Organization. Um, we, we have absolutely to talk about the gender equality. This is a very important topic, of course. Could you tell us what needs to change to improve gender equality in care? And what are the social uh, labour market and economics returns? of the policy measures to reduce gender inequalities. Thank you very much, Anna, and greetings everybody here in the room and on screen. Um, the International Labour Organization, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is a UN agency. We are tripartite, meaning that we are composed of um, employers' organizations, workers' organizations, and government representatives who come together to shape conditions um, of work and policies um, for the world of work. I think it was probably important to set that out. I just want to quickly go back to what was said at the beginning, because I was a little bit surprised by the numbers who said that they were not providing any form of care. I mean, care is essentially a human activity. It's also an existential activity. We need care to survive. You know, it's something that we either provide to ourselves on a daily basis or is provided for us um, on a daily basis. We cannot survive. We cannot get up in the morning. We cannot, you know, um, feed ourselves, go to work, be fed, be looked after without care. So all of us, all of us here in this room provide care in some form or other. And we know that women, again, you know, there's a very gendered line when it comes to care provision. Within households, women provide the vast majority of care. It comes from the way our societies have been structured for a very long time, that this is seen as women's responsibilities, largely because women give birth. It's a reproductive role that women have <coughs> that means that the care responsibilities are very often attached to women. Luckily, that's changing, that's evolving. I think Sweden would also say that many policies have put in place to encourage sharing, better sharing of family responsibilities between um, households, within households, but also between, or between households and the state. And this is very um, important. Because whilst care is something that we all benefit from, that we will all like to provide um, as well, um, you know, um, during our lives, we've also heard about, you know, the toll that it can also take um, when the burden, if I can put it that way, of assuming those responsibilities is disproportionate or is unequal. 
And again, we know around the world women provide maybe two to three times more unpaid care, so informal care, I think you say in Europe, um, than men. And this has a huge impact in terms of limiting opportunities. These may be opportunities to actually enter into paid work and to gain some economic aut um, autonomy. It may be opportunities to participate in other aspects of life, be it cultural life, political life, or even have a more rewarding social life. Um, we know that also when women enter into paid work, again, the responsibilities that they carry in terms of unpaid work may limit the type of work that they go into. It may limit the hours that they can you know, contribute at work because they are spending so much time in unpaid work, um, hours um, in the home. So part-time work, um, precarious work, more informal work arrangements. We see too many women, again, having to resort to in an attempt to balance um, work um, and family life. So having policies that encourage um, equal sharing of family responsibilities, um, not only within households, cha changing this gendered nature, as we've seen in many of the Nordic countries, have been put in place but also strong investments in care services so that, again, um, when needed, childcare can be provided through collective means, um, that elderly care can be provided at a high quality, again, through collective means, through care for um, persons with disabilities who need it, can be provided, again, through this collective responsibility is absolutely sh essential. And ILO was really pleased to be able to contribute, actually, to the, European, to the development of the European care strategy. Let me end, because I know time is limited, by talking a little bit about the investments. Because whilst investment in care is essential, really essential, um, to any strategy to advance gender equality and, um, you know, equitable um, opportunities between um, you know, women and men in all our diversity, um, I would say. There also, there's a strong case in terms of the economic benefits as well for um, investment um, in care. We know that um, from the work that the ILO has done that looking at the EU27, we've developed a tool which is a macro simulator and we've run it for the EU27 countries. And we estimate that actually um, adequate investment in universal child care and long-term care services in the EU27 could generate more than 13 million jobs by 2030. Three million of these would be direct jobs in child care, eight million direct jobs in long-term care, and the pandemic showed us how acutely these jobs are needed and how they need to be of decent um, quality. Um, the social partners have talked about that, so I won't spend um, time going into that anymore. But two million would also be indirect jobs in non-care sectors because of the services, um, the goods, etc., that are needed um, to support um, those jobs. Um, in terms of the actual investment, we, re we, we have estimated that something in the region of 567 billion um, would be needed um, for the, uh, as an initial upfront investment for the EU27, which sounds an awful lot. It translates before taxes to something like 3% of GDP. But you would get all of that back through um, the tax revenue that you would get, through um, the cuts in unemployment benefits, for instance, also that you would get. Um, and you, we estimate that funding requirement for all policies would drop to a net 2% of GDP by 2030. I know I'm running out of time, but I hope I'm making the case there as well for the fact that um, you know, investment um, in care really is an investment. It's an invest economic investment. It's a social investment. Um, it's a win-win-win all round. Too often it's still seen as a cost, a cost to the public purse. It's seen as an expenditure. And I think that mindset really does need to change if we're going to advance in this. Mm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mrs. King. Thank you, Shidi. This is a very, very... Thank Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So, so important you talk about investment and, uh, and uh, I, I really like what you said. Care is a, is, is a human activity. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, you know, paying a visit to your mother, your grandmother, that's care also. Of course, we need professional people to do that, but there is also that kind of care. Thank you very much for your message. Um, so let me be honest with you. We're running a little bit out of time, but the topic is too important. It's not possible to speed up. So we will take some time to have some question and answer. I'm a bit of a rebel. Excuse me about that. But we have great experts, and we would like to make your uh, voice heard. So very quickly, we have questions from online people. But first, uh, in the room, 
room if we have a question i see yes could you could you voice it we won't have a lot of time but can can you please give a mic to this gentleman yes thank you. very quickly please but yeah thank you thank you very much um a key topic hasn't been talked about here is uh, why do people do work in social care they do it for the social impact but more and more social care workers when i speak to them they tell me I'm spending more time measuring what I'm doing, reporting on what I'm doing, than actually doing the social impact, building the relationships, and so forth. Um, so particularly maybe for the social partners, why isn't this part of your uh, work, upcoming work, uh, and maybe for the EU and for uh, Swedish authorities, what are you doing to make sure social workers can actually do social work and not reporting, measuring, so forth? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody will not uh, have to answer that, but who, who wants, maybe about, about, about Sweden, maybe Jenny, what, what could you say to that? I totally agree with you. I have myself work experience in elderly care, and it's a lot of documentation and measuring. Uh, in Sweden, we try to support the municipalities to use more digital tools to make it easier to document, not, not to travel back and forth to document, but to use digital tools to make uh, the working easier and to be able to spend more time with the people that you're actually caring for. So that is one of the main part, I think. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, we, we also have to take a, a question from the people who are online. And uh, there, there is a big one on the screen right in front of us. You can all see it, Katarina. I think it will be for you. This mm -hmm. is the question. What words of compassion can you share to nurses' recovery of the pandemic? And how can the care strategy can be uh, of support for the professional future very quickly before the conclusion, Katarina. Yes, what could you say about indeed, that? Indeed, very quickly. I think compassion is very important, but it's more important to act because without action, compassion just remains a compassion and that's it. So how can we, how can we act and the care strategy? First of all, uh, for all the care workers, they need to have not only access to education and upskilling, but they also need to have the access to the protection of their mental health. Their occupational health and safety at work should be something taken into account. And in the care strategy, we have a quite a big act and, ac accent on the mental health of professional workers, but also informal workers, because this is very relevant for them as well. Uh, second of all, we have seen many questions in the slide. I know that we don't have time, but I want to, to say one thing, which which we can also consider as a like, closing remark. Okay, let's, let's go that way. <laughs> exactly. You're the boss, Katarina. Well, I'm fine with you. that. <laughs> so I think when we listen, all of us, and when we take the, the look at the figures on the, on the care, we are away in a vicious circle because it is a low paid sector. The working hours are very difficult. We have some figures say 95, some figures say 98 female uh, uh, care workforce. We need indeed to break this vicious circle. Uh, I think social partners should, uh, should really uh, push a lot for a social dialogue in the area of, of care. The sector of social dialogue, which is something planned for the future European strategy on, on the social dialogue, which is in the preparation, uh, is something that should be, should be visible. And there are indeed good examples. And I know maybe the Swedish model and the, the Nordic models with a strong social partners really working uh, uh, together on the, on the cause is a way forward for sure and this is something that we need to find out. A second uh, or the third or whichever is we need to make the care profession more attractive and then all of these elements from the better salaries, from the better working conditions, from seeing future perspective opportunities will be something that will attract young people and I don't say young women because we also need young men who will continue their, their career in the, in the care industry. And then indeed uh, it needs to be a, a very good balance uh, uh, between the private and public because we, can, we have seen indeed uh, many uh, 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 un, uh, uh, well, regrettable, I would, I would dare to say, situations. But uh, 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 for this, we really need to respect the quality standards and everyone needs, needs to respect, be it 
public, private, uh, uh, temporary, or whichever care service. So I hope that I managed to, to wrap up a bit, but indeed, uh, let's try to break this uh, vicious circle. Very good. Thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you very much. So uh, one last word. Thank you. Thank you, dear experts, for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear audience, for being with us. Thank you, uh, Katarina, for uh, your uh, comments. Um, there is another workshop with, uh, with that will start in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Bienvenue à ce deuxième atelier sur la stratégie européenne en matière de soins. Nous sommes ici en very important topic, which is ensuring access to quality care services. So we are surrounded, as you see, by great experts. How are you doing, doing guys? Is that okay? Yeah, so I will be back to you in a few seconds to uh, introduce you. Uh, and we also have um, uh, Dana with us. I'm going to introduce you in a few seconds. But first, uh, let's start with uh, Daniel. Daniel uh, Molinuevo, you are a research manager at the Eurofound. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> we have uh, Yolanta Reingard. I hope the pronunciation is okay. Uh, feel free to correct me. You are team leader at the European Institute for Gender Equality. We also have Anna uh, Jena Nozal, you're a senior economist at the OECD. And we have Maria Cara Janidou, you have a research uh, officer at the London School of Economics. Everything's correct? Okay, no mistakes for me. Great. So, uh, and as I was saying, we are also very lucky to have Dana. Dana Carmen Bachmann, you are head of unit at the Social Protection uh, uh, of the direct, uh, Directorate General for Employment at the European Commission. How are you doing, Dana? Great. Great, yeah? Okay, very good. So uh, um, we're going to get back to you in a few seconds, but let me just give some practical information, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any comment to share, about what you are going to hear, feel free to use the hashtag EU Social Forum. And if you have any question that you would like to ask at the end of the session, people in the room, very simple, you just have to raise your hand and we will give you a mic. And the people online, you can post your questions on Slido. What is Slido? Well, just to Reminded, Slido is an interact, interactive tool, sorry, that uh, is uh, possible for you to ask some question, but we will also run some polls. So how does it work? Very easy. You just have to grab your, scan, uh, your smartphone and you have to scan the QR code that you see on the screen. And this will lead you and connect you directly to the question. So I propose just to start right now with the first question. Very easy, ladies and gentlemen. Scan the QR code. Here is the question. Uh, could you please tell us what are the main barriers that prevent people from accessing long-term care services? So that's a very, very important question, of course. I'm going to repeat it, but please, Take your time to scan the QR code. Here is the question. What are the main barriers that prevent uh, people from accessing long-term care services? And you can see on the screen that we have a kind of a word cloud with uh, keywords that are appearing. This is very, very interesting. It's still moving a little bit because, as I told you, we are live. So it means that there is uh, maybe new keywords that are entering the system. For the moment, we see that availability and cost 
could be the main barrier. Also, of course, money, money and cost, financial. We see that there are several keywords around, let's say, finance. That's very important. It, it's moving uh, quite fast. Actually, I don't have a lot of time to read that. But we saw also that uh, there is uh, something about uh, care offers, uh, lack of information. All those things are very, very important. So let's keep the word cloud on the screen. Dana, I would like uh, to ask you, what could you tell us about the Commission's work to improve access to long-term care and help, of course, overcome the challenges we see in the world cloud. What could you tell us about that, Dana? Yeah, so good morning, everyone. And really, yeah, I'm quite heartened to see a bit that the results of this cloud uh, somehow confirm very much also the research that we have behind the uh, challenges in accesses because we feel it's really a multidimensional issue because it relates indeed a lot to affordability to high cost, but it also relates to simple lack of available services or services that are of good quality and very much tailored to the actual needs. Um, so there are these different dimensions of inequality in accessing, uh, with the poorest people being the ones that need it more, and then the ones that are less able to afford it, and there are regional inequalities. We have parts of EU where a very, very small percentage of population needing care actually accesses. And then we have parts of Europe, we had Sweden before, that really have a very good uh, uh, service provision enabling much broader access. Uh, and sometimes also within one and the same country, depending on whether you live in a rural, uh, urban environment, you may be prevented. The quality dimension was mentioned earlier this morning because uh, it's not only that you need a service, but you need a service that actually is tailored to what you need and really puts the focus on the person and their own uh, needs. And then um, obviously there is the gender inequality, uh, as we have heard and will hear more, with many women living longer, of course, and then uh, alone and needing more care and then uh, being less able to afford and access such care services. So how we address this? With the care strategy, we really try to tackle all the different uh, dimensions of access. And first and foremost, it all starts from having in place a much stronger public role in delivery and organization of long-term care services. So we start by uh, proposing, and actually it has been accepted in the council negotiation, that social protection for long-term care is reinforced in terms of um, uh, its adequacy, the level of support that it provides in terms of timeliness and also in terms of the needs that it covers. Then um, we also look uh, at the dimension of the simple and very factual need to expand significantly the services that are available because it's not only you need more social protection but you need services to be there and you need services to have a good mix so that people depending on their different life situations and different care needs could uh, have a choice between various options. Then. Obviously, we need to focus much more on the quality because the services need to be of quality and then that goes also through more investment into staff, attractiveness of the profession and uh, working conditions, better pay and so forth. Um, and then there is the whole dimension of investment. It has been mentioned investment that needs to be backed up by strong reforms that go into the direction of integrated care, quality care, person-centered care, but also tapping much more into the potential of digital technologies without losing the human dimension of care. And last but not least, I would say it's also by empowering stakeholders because we are here today to keep and even accelerate the momentum of the care strategy of the COVID in order to have commitment from each of us and all the levels we are working to take concrete steps in addressing these challenges. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So many uh, uh, very important topics that you just shared, and we're going to talk about that, dear experts. I have some questions coming, coming up for you, uh, but I just would like to tell you that uh, 
you don't have to agree about everything, all right? It means that if you have different opinions, that's fine. It will make it even uh, richer for the audience. So feel very free to express yourself about what you think. Daniel, I'd like to start with you. Daniel, you are research manager at the Eurofound. Uh, we saw on the slide a question, the first question, that, of course, finance costs, high costs, uh, and also availability prevent people from accessing the long-term care. I really would like to ask you, uh, is it confirmed by your research findings, and what are the main dimensions mm -hmm. of access to long-term care services, and how can we best address those challenges? And I know that Dana just underlined it. She talked about uh, digital uh, uh, technologies, and probably you have a word to share about that. Daniel. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. I'm pleased to see that in the middle of the cloud we have availability because that is something that comes over and over in the research that we do as, as, a, as a barrier. And when it comes to accessibility, it's important to understand that the aging of the population is also obviously having an impact as well on the workforce. So we have that long-term care workers are not always being replaced when they retire by younger colleagues. And this is an issue of particular concern in rural areas because the number of workers in those areas was uh, already low as a starting point. So it's important to have in mind when looking at accessibility that that urban and rural divide and look at ways into uh, which we can tackle that urban rural divide and the barriers in uh, rural areas. Like for example, if we uh, look at how to retain and recruit staff there, there's initiatives that provide wage premiums or wage increases above the, the average to ensure that as staff are attracted to work in, in rural areas. Um, I see as well that cost Money uh, features very strongly in the slide, and if we have to choose one barrier, or say what's the main barrier, I, th I think we're safe to say that cost is still, or affordability issues are still probably the, the leading reason why people don't avail of long-term care services, or at least that's what data from our European Quality of Life survey and also data from uh, Eurostat tells us. And here, well, there's a number of initiatives that are being put in place, for example, uh, using vouchers to increase the, the um, income that is available without changing the prices or looking into caps into prices or exemptions in out-of-pocket payments. I'm very surprised that physical accessibility is not featured in this slide because that is something, again, that is very prominent in uh, rural areas. So we're looking at issues around high transportation costs or other people that are not able to drive or they don't have a car. And there's, again, a number of initiatives there to tackle that physical accessibility barrier, be it telecare or, uh, for example, having mobile care units that bring care, bring care to service users or uh, transportation initiatives that bring service users to uh, care mm -hmm. facilities. Um, uh, when it comes to all, all these barriers, uh, as I said before, it's very important to look into this urban and rural divide. I mean, even for things like affordability, it's important to bear in mind that the, some of the main sectors in rural areas, like for instance agriculture, they ha are characterized by seasonality, informality, and uh, lower wages, and therefore that means that the um, resources available in pensions later on in life to, uh, for long-term care are lower, um, but we don't have initiatives specifically targeted for ability issues in rural areas. So I think it's very important always to look not only into what services are available and for whom, but the where, and look at this urban rural divide, because when we look at EU research or, or we come to uh, EU conferences, there's always like a bar chart with all the EU national averages in all, all the countries, and that, that um, sometimes um, makes that we overlook this urban-rural divide, and I think that the uh, rural care action plan is a step in the right direction. And, and the lastly, when it comes to digital technology, I think the, the impact that they, the, or the potential for them to uh, uh, tackle accessibility barriers and to ensure the sustainability of long-term care is, is uh, um, massive, and therefore we need to avail of it. You know? If we look at the recommendations that are issued as part of the semester, we have that there are countries that year after year they ask either to contain cost or even to decrease long-term care expenditure, and then at the same time they're being asked to increase the quality and accessibility of long-term care. 
So it's not very easy to achieve all of this at the same time. And this is where digital technologies uh, can play an important role because they, they can help to achieve efficiency gains, uh, which allow uh, savings, which allow staff to uh, work on their core care tasks rather than being doing paperwork. And also from the service user perspective, it's uh, also an opportunity for people to age in place. If they want to stay long in their homes, technologies like smart homes or telecare, they, they made that possible. So um, it's very difficult to know what the exact impact of this technology is. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of noise. It's very easy to you know, grab the attention of headlines saying you know, that jobs are, robots are going to steal all of our jobs or um, uh, say that there's disruptive technologies that are going to change and, and, and deliver uh, long-term care um, at a low cost. But it's important to you know, look and to tap into this potential and to look at specific impacts because there's, there's a, um, an important potential there. Sure. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Yolanta, I'd like to ask you another question. Just as Daniel mentioned, we saw that the what, the where, and the who are important factors, of course, to enable people to access the long-term uh, care. Uh, you look more specifically at who needs uh, home-based long-term care and also the impact gender has on accessing care services. Uh, my question is very direct. What have you found and how can we promote gender equality in access to long-term care? Okay. Um, I would like to focus on three things. Um, first, we need to understand that the shortage of services or lack of services has a huge social and economic price. I can just uh, mention a few figures that, for example, every third woman who is out of labor market, is inactive, cannot return to labor market because of care duties. Uh, every fourth woman who work on part-time basis do so because of care duties. And half of people who are in part-time work they would like to work full-time, but they cannot do it because of lack of services. And lack of services and care duties falling on women actually contribute to the substantial part of gender pay gap. So we have uh, statistical calculations as well, which show that of a variety of work-life balance measures, flexible work arrangements, parental leave policies, or access to services, access to services has the most substantial impact to women's employment opportunities. So basically, and we are speaking about shortage of workforce in the labor market, and we have all these potential that, that is not used. So this is first. Second, what can we see about unmet needs when it comes to, or access to services when it comes to, to gender or gender inequality? We, three days ago, I received the data of EU-wide survey, 60,000 Europeans, about gender gaps in care. So this is the freshest thing I have in my hands, and I can tell you every fourth person in the EU, more women than men, have long-term care duties. They have someone that they need to, to care about. And the, the, the uh, hours that are required for that are on average up to three hours per day. So it's quite, quite a lot. If we look at who is doing the most intensive here from seven hours, even up to 10 and even more, it's mostly women. So, so these are the ones probably, I assume, who are, who are outside the labor markets. We need to explore that a little bit more. Which are the most often used services among women and men? So it's nurse and healthcare assistant service, other healthcare professionals and domestic cleaners and helpers. If we, use, uh, if we look at the gender dimension on access to services, the gender gap on average is 15 percentage points to the detriment of women. It means men are using services much, much more than women. And the biggest gender gap sign access to residential facilities, home-based personal care workers, and live-in cares. I assume these are more expensive, these require more economic resources, and women, for obvious reasons, cannot access them to the same extent as men. An interesting finding is that every fifth person indicated 
that the care, uh, the person who needs care refuses services in the refused services in the last three months. What does it mean? Might be cultural reasons, but it w might well be that it's too expensive, not affordable, and might also be that, that quality is not satisfactory. So the fact that people refuse what is available, I think it's quite, it's quite important. Now, uh, the third point that I want to say about the quality of services. Nine out of 10 people who are providing personal care services are women who are working there, and we know how undervalued and underpaid these jobs are, because this was exposed during the pandemic so clearly. And we also know that people, because of so social psychological stress, bad working conditions, exposure to harassment, and all these facts, they're leaving the sector. We have already evidence coming from some countries where nurses are running away because they can't take it anymore. And, and that is the, the problem that we'll be increasingly facing. A lack of skills. 90% of people who work there, they have just basic education. We are facing also problems of underqualified staff. On the other hand, we have a number of undeclared migrants who might be overqualified, but their skills are not recognized. And, and by the way, uh, personal care workers is the third among three professions that are fall into the most undeclared work category. I mean, domestic workers who are filling in care gaps, and they're mostly women, migrant women, so we're facing intersecting inequalities here as well that need to be addressed. So uh, I don't want to uh, find maybe more problems, but we also have a, a, this segregation problem, maybe the last thing that I would like to say. We talk a lot about how to attract women to STEM. How to attract women, men to caring professions. Look. <laughs> We need to do something with the status and prestige because if it keeps going like this, I, I am afraid it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not attractive. We are not, uh, we're not going to, to resolve this problem in the, in the nearest future. Thank you, Yolanta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Anna, um, you have a joint project with the European Commission to analyze social protection in long-term care. Uh, so based on the results of your research, can uh, people in need afford to pay for formal health services? That's the first question. And combined to this, I'd like to ask you, are our social protection systems fit to deal with current and future long-term care needs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'm very happy to be here um, to have, again, in-person meetings. Um, so you asked the question about affordability uh, of services. So I'll, I'll start first by um, explaining that in the project what we did was uh, trying to understand what would be the cost uh, for people if they were actually not um, having any sort of social protection or public support. So just to give you a sense of how um, expensive long-term care is. So when we look at this across a variety of European countries, um, what we see is that even for uh, persons who have uh, what we call low care needs, um, we talk about six hours of care needs per week, uh, even for these people, if they don't have any kind of public support, and they had to pay um, everything by themselves, um, this would also be already be a problem for people on low income, because this would uh, amount to about 60% of their income of uh, an older person uh, on, on low income at the 20th percentile. Now, when we talk about needs that are higher, uh, what we call the moderate or average needs, uh, we're talking already uh, just above 20 hours per week of care. Um, this amounts to uh, one and a half times the median income of an older person. Uh, clearly, um, the average person, the median person, cannot afford this based on just their income. They would need to uh, start saving before they actually get to those needs. And if we go to even more severe needs, people who are uh, bedridden, who need uh, permanent support for more than 40 hours of, um, a week of care, uh, we're talking already about 
three times the median income of a person. Even people on the very high income scale, this is already above the 20th percentile of income. So if, if there is no social protection, um, this, this is a, a great problem for people. They would need to rely on their families. They would uh, need to save, as I say, or they would have their needs unmet. And what we've seen in some countries is that there are actually beds that are being occupied, hospital beds, uh, because simply they cannot afford to provide for this. So because healthcare is free and universal, they end up occupying beds for a long period of time. So this is just to give an idea of how expensive it is. Now, all European countries provide some sort of public support for those needs, but uh, it varies greatly. So if we look at the cost that I've just talked about, we, have, uh, we, we didn't cover all European countries. We're, we're striving to get there, but we have a, a fairly good selection uh, of countries. And of those, we have mostly the Nordic countries, uh, so about five countries in Europe where public support amount to 90% of the, the cost that I'm t I was mentioning. But on the other hand, we have about five European countries where it's below 50% of that, that the cost. Uh, that means that this translates into substantial out-of-pocket costs for people. Uh, we are talking uh, about the out of cost uh, where, again, it goes above 50% of your income, and then you are already struggling uh, if you have to pay for the house, for uh, food, for uh, your basic needs. Um, and, when we, uh, and currently, uh, what we also see is, uh, I mentioned the, the issue of severe needs and a low income. Uh, this is already something that we currently see that in a number of countries, people are not protected enough. So when we talk about severe needs, we have about eight countries in Europe where um, the out-of-pocket costs, they actually amount to 90% or even above 100% of your income. This is just the out-of-pocket cost. Um, and similarly for people on low uh, income, uh, there are eight countries in the EU uh, where if, they, if people had to uh, pay out of, out of their pocket for institutional care, it's, it's also beyond their income. Um, so clearly, even at the, at the current state, um, where, where we are, uh, there are gaps, um, as I mentioned, for severe and low-income people. Um, but we're talking about um, uh, great increase in aging. Uh, the, the share of people who are 80 and above is going to double by 2050. So if, if currently there are gaps, what is going to be the situation in, in uh, a few years' time uh, in terms of the sustainability. And what we see is that even currently, even the countries that are doing uh, extremely well in reducing um, the, the poverty risk associated with long-term care, um, they don't bring people back to what we call the baseline. That is, you still need out-of-pocket costs. You're still uh, not having the same income uh, as uh, if you didn't have any long-term care needs. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. All is about money. <laughs> yeah, money, money, money. It reminds, me, it reminds me of a very famous song from a Swedish band. Uh, I don't want to make fun of this, but this is very, very important to, to, to be sensitive to this. And uh, Maria, you are a research officer at the London Schools of Economics. Um, we just heard that most people, that's a fact, that's a reality, most people cannot afford long-term care services. We don't have to prove that, it's very well demonstrated. Now, how can we finance the fast rising public expenditure on long-term care so that it is also fiscally sustainable in the long term? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, first of all, um, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I think that by making um, part of the social protection uh, would be a first step to make that um, uh, fiscally sustainable. The thing is that it's not just making that f physically sustainable. It, it has to be fair uh, and flexible as well. Uh, it, uh, so um, it... Um, um, 
we did a paper uh, almost a year ago at, at LSE comparing some forms of funding uh, and comparing social insurance, some form of funding long-term care, including social insurance, um, tax-based systems, uh, safety net systems. And what we found is that uh, social insurance has be, uh, it, it's more fair in terms that it has the potential to be fairer in terms of how resources are raised, are there are progressive and are not regressive as in a tax-based uh, system. Uh, in terms of flexibility, both uh, tax-based and uh, social insurance systems have a degree of a dependence of the labor market, which, which makes things uh, complicated. And finally, in terms of sustainability, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, countries that, are, that are, have social insurance, um, this leads to hypothecated revenues for long-term care, which is a very important thing because um, uh, these uh, hypothecated uh, uh, revenues and this money cannot be transferred to other parts of the public uh, expenditures. Uh, in, in contrast, on a tax-based uh, system, there is a constant uh, competition um, of the, of the long-term care funding with other areas of public spending, including for, which are, of course, very important, which are education, health, and there is no uh, stable funding that goes to long-term care. So, overall, um, uh, for a fiscal sustainable long-term care system, there is definitely a need to be there a standing resource of funding, a flow of money that is going to be stable at least to the extent uh, possible. But there has to be some other criteria and some other um, uh, things as well which are extremely important. To have a very well organized long-term care system because it's not only having the money there on the pot, the thing is where those money are going to. If you don't have a very well structured long-term care system, there it's, you know, it's easier to lose that uh, part of the money uh, and of course to have clear eligibility uh, criteria. Social insurance systems tend to have more clear eligibility criteria which are extreme, extremely important to be, uh, to be uh, there. So this was my um, um, quick reply on, on that. Thank you very much, Maria. Money and structure, that's important to what you just said, uh, the way the, the, the money is, uh, is spent. Um, now it's time for uh, the Q&A uh, session. So uh, people online, you just have to post your question on the Slido app. But we're going to start with the room here. Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question to our experts? You just have to raise your hand. Yeah, no question. It was so clear. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a look at the. Let's have a look at the. Oh yeah, you have a question. Okay. Uh, please, could we give a mic to this gentleman? Uh, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. People are running. Yes, over there. Yes, the first row. Very good. We're listening to you. Um, Thank you. I'll get back to what you said about the title of the Swedish song, um, <laughs> Money, Money, Money. Yeah. Um, the EU care strategy tries to, uh, to strengthen investment into all kinds of care services, so that's great, that's perfect, that's what is needed and we all agree on that and we, we heard what it costs to people personally if there's no investment and no social protection for that. Um, but it is in the context of the economic governance framework, which for the moment is muted uh, because of the general escape clause. But uh, it is still in place. It's about to be reviewed. And we have, coming out of the pandemic and, we ha and with the, the, the energy crisis and government support measures for it, uh, we have very high public debt levels. So how can those two calls be reconciled, or calls? There's no call yet to reduce public, uh, public debt, but we expect that in the next five, 10 years, there will be quite strong incentives towards member states to rein in public debt. So how can we ensure that this call for investment is not only heard, but heard in a sustainable way, given that care needs are only increasing, there's an increasing uh, 
need for services and, and we want to improve conditions, which, working conditions and quality, which ultimately also will cost more money. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to, to, to answer the question? I can take one, yeah, maybe. yeah, Dana. Okay. Oh, I think it's a question that comes okay, <laughs> over and over good. again. And um, uh, basically, first, uh, it's important to acknowledge that already in the past year there has been lots of progress in the way the pillar principles have been reflected in the semester and in terms of the country specific recommendations because we really saw a shift towards more focus on adequacy, quality, expansion of services, supporting women labor market participation, instead of pure focus on fiscal sustainability. Of course, the rules, I cannot comment on, on the final outcomes of the review of the fiscal rules, but uh, you have seen, I think, also the communication last uh, week from the Commission with obviously very strong call of uh, pursuing uh, in a transparent and long-term uh, process the debt reduction process, but really accompanied by investment and reforms in all areas, including in social areas. So I think this is the way forward, but of course we will also wait for the leaders uh, to have a final uh, say on the revision of the fiscal rules. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dana. Thank you very much, sir, for your question. We also have questions from uh, online uh, audience, and here is one. So you can read it uh, with me on the screen. How can we increase the spread of more attractive and user-oriented care provision models, such as the ones offered by social economy? That's a good question. But you are the experts, Guy. <laughs> Anyone about this? How can we increase the spread of more attractive and uh, user-oriented care models? I can take it. Yeah? There's no volunteer. Okay, but Dana, let's wait Dana maybe the you, others. You, you just saved our life, Dana. Thank you very much again. No, I think <laughs> with the care strategy, we really highlight a lot the important role of social economy organizations in their different forms and shapes. And we call on member states to provide a very clear and supportive regulatory environment. Also next year the Commission will come out with a proposal um, precisely to guide such a regulatory re environment that supports uh, a social economy organization to, throw, to strive. And um, I believe more and more we hear the issue of having also new innovative governance models that bring public authorities together with civil society organization, uh, not-for-profit social economy organizations in order to design together and deliver together high quality proximity services very much linked to the needs of local communities and um, yeah, supporting a human-centered uh, uh, economic social environment within their communities. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I you very much. Maria. Uh, I, yeah, yes, sure, Maya. Can I add something on the user-oriented care provision models? Yep. I want my glasses so I can see the, you know, <laughs> um, the questions. Uh, I think that another interesting aspect was to do more surveys on attitudes, mm. on uh, what people um, they actually want for they for their care, for their future care, and for their um, care for their, their relatives. And I'm saying that because recently we did. Um, a kind of this, uh, this was the first time that we did a survey like this in Greece and uh, what we found is totally um, contradicting what we are thinking that the Greek people are needing as a care. We are thinking at, at, the, at, at the moment we are believe that uh, Greece is still at the familiar, familiar based model but uh, what people want what the survey, the results of the survey are shown that people are far away from that and they have different opinions and there has to be uh, a, co a common point and the services, they have to be closer to what the people are need in order to use them. Otherwise, we're going to end up having long-term care services and people were not uh, going there to use them. This is another important issue. Mm. Sure. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, the one last, just for the information, we, we, we are asked, what was the name of the EU survey about gender in care work that was answered by uh, 60,000 Europeans? Can we find the results online and where? Does anybody know that? Know, yes, know, Jolanta, you <laughs> save our life again. No, that was Dana and now it's Jolanta. Thank you. Very quickly. Yeah, this is the survey that I mentioned, and it was designed exactly for monitoring purposes. We need to, uh, I mean, it's uh, exact title of it is Gender Gaps in Care, Individual and Social Activities. Data was recently collected. It's actually micro data. I received it three days before I came to the forum. So you can imagine it's not yet publicly available, but the results will start coming out uh, soon. You have my name in agenda. You can always write to me and I will share with you what is, uh, what is available. But the idea to uh, uh, beyond the survey is exactly to reflect on provisions in care strategy. We worked, we reached out to the G employment, to the G just, and to indeed formulate questions in a way that contribute to the implementation of strategy to, to the best a possible extent and indeed to, to see what are people's needs, what are the problems that they're facing, what, what are these kind of to get users, you no know, perspective as well into, okay. into this. Thank you very much, Yolanta. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another slide of questions, so, so that would be combined with the conclusion, if you're okay with that, Dana. Uh, so, guys, you know how it works. You just have to scan the QR code. The question is uh, actually very simple. Is what are your key takeaways from this session? So you can uh, enter just some uh, words, and we will have uh, word cloud that will be designed on the screen in a few seconds so question is very easy well to ask maybe not to answer i don't know what are your key takeaways from this session just have to scan the qr code and get on slido okay we have a big money appearing on the on the screen <laughs> investment so let me just uh, read some of them like uh, political commitment uh, and we're going to have more the money is very visible on the screen of course because we all talked about that gender equality of course uh, is is something very very important gender uh, dimension uh, so what do we have it's moving guys we are live so i have to partnerships yes quality guidelines so the 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 world club is is about to move again all right but anyway dana I, i'd like to can i challenge you a little bit okay wisely and 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 kindly just you, Dana, what, what could you be your three personal learnings mm. uh, of this session? And you can get some inspiration, of course, from the World Cloud. What are your key, three key learnings in, in three key words, for example? Yeah, well, first, I think I would like to discuss more with Daniel about uh, their analysis on the rural-urban divide. I found very interesting the link you made to the local economy and less revenues in those areas. So I think that's something we would need to look deeper into. Then um, I would um, definitely be very happy to support disseminating the results of the survey because I think it really, I found very telling very powerful the figures that you mentioned and when it talks about money I would say it's not only about the money because there is lots of money that is poured into the system but it's also about the quality of investments that are made and I think this is what we also need to focus Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. So, guys, it's already the end. I know we, we, we would like to spend more time on this, but we will probably later. I uh, really would like to thank you very much, uh, dear experts, for being with us. Thank you very much, Dana, for saving my life a few minutes ago. Thank you very much, <laughs> dear audience, for being with us here in the room online. And I'd like to have a special thanks for the technical team. You don't see them, but it's not possible to do what we do in the light if there is nobody in the shades. So thank you, guys, for for uh, organizing all this and also for the translators who are over there. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.
are surrounded by great experts. We have uh, three experts here on the set, but we also have uh, some other experts that are online. I'm going to introduce you in a few seconds. How are you doing first? Are you, are you fine? Yeah? yeah. Yeah, okay, very good, very good. Uh, so let me just uh, introduce you. Uh, Natasha, Natasha Azopardi Muscat, yes, you are online. Hi, uh, you are an uh, expert on integrated uh, care at the Regional Office for uh, Europe at the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Anknis, Dr. Nis, you are a professor of organization and a policy, sorry, uh, in the long term at the Vrij Universiteit van Amsterdam. Is it correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. Welcome, Professor. Welcome, Doctor. Sorry. And uh, we also have uh, Philippe Seidel Leroy. Yes, hi, Philippe. Hi. You are Policy uh, Manager on Social Protection at the Age Platform Europe. And we also have uh, Dorte Mark, Mrs. Mark, you are online. You are a Quality and Development Manager uh, in a Psychiatric hospital is that correct you can make a great things like that yes i see you okay great thank you very much uh, mrs mark york from denmark and we are also very lucky to have flaviana teudesiu uh, you are a team leader uh, uh, at the long-term uh, care uh, at the european commission so flaviana how are you doing today are you okay i'm very excited to be here and to okay. be part of the panel yes. so we'll get back to you in a few seconds but i would like just to give you some practical information very quickly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any comments to share, you can use the hashtag EU Social Forum. If you have any question you would like to ask to one of our experts, very easy people in the room at the end of the session, <coughs> you will just have to raise your hand. And the people online, you just have to post your question on Slido. So what is Slido? Slido is an interactive tool that we're going to use to make and create some interactions between you, the audience, and us and the experts, of course. This is very, very easy to use. Now you should be uh, uh, okay with that. There is a QR code on the screen, so you just have to scan the QR code with your smartphone and you will be immediately connected to Slido. Let's start right now with a first question, ladies and gentlemen, here is the question. Uh, what is, according to you, the biggest challenge in putting people first in care? So you can just enter one single word. Let me repeat the question. What is the biggest challenge in putting people first in care? One single word, and we should see in a few seconds a word cloud, cloud that is going to be designed on the screen. So what, what, what should you tell me, Philip, in one word? What is the biggest challenge? It's one not word. one word, actually. It's turning the system around. It's not built okay. for putting people first. Good, good. Oh, we have words now. It's, it's, oh, we have money, we have power, we are staffing shortage, we have uh, believing in people, funding, quality, uh, design, economics, people, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, challenges as we can see here. Uh, so uh, let, let's go with you, Flavania, as an introduction. Uh, what do you think of the word cloud and uh, what can you tell us about the European care strategy ambition to improve uh, quality on the long term? Care. Thank you, thank you, Alain. Uh, I would start also by sort of linking this last workshop to the workshops before, because uh, uh, it's not a coincidence that the session of quality of care comes last. Yep. Uh, after discussing about the workforce, about social protection for long-term care, about the financing of, of, of long-term care, because quality is really the tip of the iceberg, yeah? It's, it's a corollary of all of these things that have been discussed previously. And it's also the tip of the iceberg for the people in need of care because this is what they experience more, more directly. Uh, at the same time, while being the tip of the iceberg, it's also the Achilles heel, heel in a way, yeah. uh, at least in my view, uh, when it comes to provision of, of quality care because um, quality is understood in a variety of ways across Europe. There's really no standard, no definition of what quality is and it's also notoriously difficult to measure. 
Um, and the concept itself of quality is evolving. Uh, it's, in the past, it used to be really focused on medical outcomes for people in need of long-term care. And now we are really seeing, and I see also that the slide results reflected a bit of a mindset shift, a paradigm shift towards putting in the center the quality of life of the people in need of care. So um, with these uh, reflections on, on quality, I would go to the care strategy and its provisions on, uh, on, on quality care. Uh, basically, for uh, the main message that we put on quality care is that it empowers people to maintain their autonomy and to live a life in dignity. And this is from an individual perspective. And then from a societal perspective, it's really a measure of society's ability to uphold fundamental rights. Uh, and it's a measure of ourselves, in a way, as a society to collectively be able to, to do that. So uh, what do we recommend member states through the care strategy, and in particular through the recommendation on long-term care, what do we recommend the member states in this, in this area? Well, first of all, the main message is that we need high-quality standards in all care settings, and this standards should be tailored to the specific characteristics of the, of the various settings, be they residential or home care or community-based care. And also, uh, these, uh, these standards should be applied equally to all service providers, irrespective of their legal uh, status. And we did here in the previous uh, workshop some um, remarks and reflections about the, uh, the balance between public and private. The bottom line for quality is that regardless of the, of the um, um, legal status, these standards have to be upheld in a very strict, in a very strict manner. Uh, about how this could be done, uh, the recommendation there is that uh, member states set up if they don't have or ensure that they have a, a, a quality framework. And this quality framework would uh, basically lay the basis for a common understanding and for a common approach of what quality is. And also the recommendation proposes a number of principles that would underpin uh, that could underpin such a, quality, such a quality framework. I will not go through the list of them because it's eight of them, but just to give you a couple of examples, that person-centeredness is one of such principles. The focus on outcomes, and the outcomes being the quality of life of the person in need of, in need of care is another one. Um, the idea of comprehensiveness and continuity of services is also very strongly reflected in the principle. And yeah, I could go on, but maybe... Uh, uh, maybe these examples are, are telling enough. But okay, quality framework, quality principles, this is theory. We need to be able to transform this into policy practices. And that's why the recommendation also includes um, uh, some elements on a quality assurance mechanism, precisely to turn this into the very pragma in a very pragmatic way in, um, in, in processes established at, uh, at, at member state level. And elements of such a quality assurance mechanism include, for, for instance, a mechanism to ensure compliance, with, uh, with, uh, with the rules, and those, um, that mechanism should be built in an inclusive way, so really co-produced in a way with, uh, with the providers and with the persons in need of care. I'm looking at Philippe because you are representing them. There's also, there also has to be capacity building uh, for, for service providers and also um, incentivization that they go beyond minimum standards and that they continuously improve the quality of, of the services provided. Resources for quality assurance, this goes without saying, and again, it all sometimes uh, uh, links back to, to financial aspects, and also integrated quality, uh, integrating quality requirements in public procurement is, uh, is another important element, part of this quality assurance uh, uh, mechanism proposal. So this is really in a nutshell what we are proposing on quality in the care strategy, but it's not only that we are making recommendations, we also uh, undertake to 
to, to do some concrete things uh, ourselves at European level. And this is also very important because it's really matching our recommendation with concrete action on our side. Uh, I will give a couple of examples. First of all, it's really about technical support to governments who want to do reforms in this area. For governments who want to, to, to make reforms on integrated care, so really bringing together the social care with health care and long-term care and center uh, and put the persons in the center. Um, for governments who want to improve quality, and here we, um, we work, we will have the pleasure of working with the World Health Organization on, on, on this aspect, and also simply funding, funding for workforce to be skilled enough, uh, funding for the uh, facilities to, to be what they need to be, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, to, to wrap it up uh, and also come back to, to the last part of your question about the objectives. Now, uh, I would put it very simple. Uh, the care strategy was born after we really consulted high and low and quite widely about what needs to be done and that what is now, you know, uh, codified or about to be codified in, a com in the council recommendation. Now, I think we are all here. Uh, to discuss about the how and to generate commitments for each of, so that each of us in our own jobs and responsibilities uh, do something about it. Some of us are doing it already, but it's really about capitalizing on this momentum. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to learn uh, from my co-panelists, uh, present, uh, present physically and, uh, and connected online, and from you all about how we could do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Flaviana. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a first question to you, Philippe. Your uh, organization represents all the people, uh, many of whom need long-term care. Could you please make their voice heard on this? And uh, how would you describe person-centered care from their perspective? Um, I will. Go back, I, but I have one comment linked to what uh, Ms. von der Leyen was saying yesterday. Okay. Uh, because she said we overcame the pandemic with solidarity. And I uh, dare to disagree because I don't know whether we overcame this pandemic. We are certainly on the way of winning the war against the virus with, uh, with vaccination, etc. But during the pandemic, we had hundreds of thousands of avoidable deaths, notably in long term care. And as long as we don't remember these and as we don't analyze why these people have died, workers and persons in long-term care, uh, we cannot say we have overcome this. We can just say we are looking forward, we are going forward. But we need also to look backwards and to, to, um, to remind this. So what does person-centered mean, to go more concrete? Um, as I said, it means turning the system around. The system is built, the care systems by and large are built on managing people, managing their biological needs, having them washed, having them fed, having them uh, get medicines. Uh, we're talking about beds. We're not talking about uh, actual people in, 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 in need for long-term care. Um, to a very large extent, it is residential, often in large facilities, which don't, um, which are difficult to. Uh, to transform into something that people would like to call home. And we're talking about people who, uh, who have challenges to their autonomy, but who have the same human aspirations that all of us. They want to be able to choose when they get up, that what they eat, what they do, what they learn, what they, uh, whom they meet, and we need to support them in that. So this is why I say it's, it's turning the system around rather than focusing on this biological needs and on um, only the idea of freeing families for, so that people are available for the labor market to start from what do people want and need. Also to accept in a certain way that sometimes people's choices are maybe not that healthy but, or, or that, that, that they might not conf um, be consistent with uh, approach of biologically, biological safety first, but people who are, have difficulties walking still want to walk and still want to go out. Maybe it is a risk to, to, to have them walk around freely, but it is a human aspiration and it's something that 
can be beneficial for their health because it, uh, um, it, um, sorry, it slows down maybe their, 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 uh, the deterioration of their health status because they stay in a certain way active. But it's complicated for care providers to do it because you have oversight, etc. So um, because you have responsibility, if they ha go out and have an accident, uh, you know who's responsible. And so this is why I'm saying that the safety-only model is not necessarily fitting people's needs. So we need to allow space for people to make decisions about their lives, even if this is very challenging to find a decision, to express their, 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 their will. I mean, care needs are very diverse, but to a very large extent, people with care needs don't have the very high care needs. They have some care needs. They need support for some things. And there are people who make the choice not to go into long-term care um, because they don't want to lose their autonomy. And they say, well, I'm maybe less taken care of when I stay at home, when I keep my, but, but I keep my independence. And this is valuable to them. And we should acknowledge this and, and support this by going into the homes of the people with formal services. Informal, informal care will always be there and will always have a strong role and needs to be supported. But we need formal services at home by people who are well trained, who uh, respond to the quality criteria that, uh, that are developed. And I think the care strategy is actually very, can be very powerful in that. Uh, if people really look at it and really look at uh, the implementation of all these principles and not on all levels. There's a very strong paragraph about in, um, involvement of stakeholders. So as a policymaker, you read that and say, okay, we do these kinds of panels with you know, government and trade unions and care providers and persons in need for care, and we talk about the legislation. That's great, that's important, but we need to break it down to the individual who has to meet with the doctor, who has to meet with the family, who has to express what he wants and who has also the right to change what he wants at a certain point. So this is why it's, um, I say it's a strong challenge to, 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 to build a person-centered approach, not only person-oriented, but person-centered, really putting the person at, in, in the middle. But it is something that we are in a certain way um, that we have to do because uh, we all said that we will have care needs at a certain point. Um, and if we want to provide dignity and also prevent you know, the concentration uh, the segregation that led to this um, huge amount of deaths in, uh, in, in long-term care settings, um, we need to, to, to really be, be serious about changing things. Okay. Thank you. You didn't see it, but some people in the audience were applauding like this, and they didn't want to interrupt you. But now you can applaud if you want, Philippe. <laughs> Thank you for your message. <laughs> no, no, no. They wanted to. They, I they, didn't do anything. They well, didn't did want to things. interrupt you. That was that, 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 that was very interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Nice from uh, uh, Amsterdam. Um, putting people first means uh, organizing all services, uh, addressing specific needs, of course, around the person receiving the care. And um, the question is, is it correct to say that it, require, that it requires some customization and some integration? If yes, how can it be achieved? And are there any proven models or good practices example? What could you say <coughs> about all that? Yes. Um, well, I think what we really need is mass individualization uh, because it's not about patient-centered care but person-centered care and every person is different. So we, if we have care standards or quality standards, we don't want standard quality or standard care, but we, don't, we want care and support that is tailored to the person. And that's a very subjective and normative issue because everyone is different and everyone thinks different things are important in their life. So it is our challenge to, so to provide uh, a good life to people, to support a good life to people. I remember in the Netherlands of the Dutch Quality Council which defines what, is quality, what should quality management and quality assurance be all about. And we have said, well, quality is about supporting people in their good, leading a good life and that's about autonomy, having meaningful relationships, and having a, a, me, a meaningful life. And that's why, what is important. And these issues uh, are 
covering a whole, f whole, all aspects of people's life. So if we look at the disability sector, for instance, it's about go being able also to go to school, having good housing, having an income, having work. For all the people, the similar, same thing holds, having a good relationships with friends, with your families, doing meaningful activities, being of importance to people when we talk about dignity is being recognized as a person who you are or who you want to be. As we are addressing all these aspects of life, we need to integrate also various professions and we also need to integrate informal cares, carers and volunteers. They together have a challenge to work with the person. And what is important to have a dialogue with the person, shared decision maker, if you want to use this jargon, uh, where you sort of agree what is important to you and how can we support you. And that requires integration of various types of supports, of domestic services, of housing, of income, of technology, whatever you can think of. And integration is a very difficult issue in the long-term care sector, in the health care sector in youth care as well. So that's a very big challenge and what we are working on, um, so we uh, in our country in the Netherlands we have developed a quality framework for nursing home care which fully covers uh, the entire pro primary process where it's about safe, it's also about safety, but it's primarily about well-being, about uh, person-centered care, but also about learning and improving. And it was said in the previous session that we might need an innovative way of governance. I don't think that we um, improve long-term care by punishing bad behaviors or whatever, but to approve what is good and to learn from each other and to, um, to support these uh, learning uh, elements. So if quality management should focus on improving. So what we saw when we issued this new um, quality framework six years ago that our inspectorate started mm -hmm. monitoring quality in a different way. So, and uh, I was working at that time at an organization where we supported organizations in implementing this quality framework. And that's not only training nurses, etc., but also in how to manage the organization. It's also about leadership in the organization, not only of the managers, but also of various professions, taking their professional leadership. So in the past few years we have supported, I would say, one quarter of all facilities in the Netherlands to implement this long-term care framework and about half the organizations that we have in uh, working with this framework. And it only can work if you work on the work floor with the people working in practice and in the boardrooms and everything which, what is in between. And very often we think, well, we give a training to the nurses and nurse assistants and the volunteers, etc. Check, that's done. But that's not enough. If there is not a culture in the organization where is safety to, if you have made mistakes, to discuss these mistakes and not being afraid of have your head being chopped off or something like that, mm -hmm. even less strict uh, <laughs> measures, um, if that is not the culture, leadership should have a culture of learning and improving and providing the safety in which you can learn. And that's not something that you can blame the nurses for, for instance, or the care staff, but that's something that you have to work on in the boardroom and on the various levels of management. So you also need to integrate the various levels in an organization. You need to integrate the various disciplines, but also with in this case, if you have a nursing home, but if you're working in the community, also the various elements in, in the society, the social care, the housing sector, etc. And that is coordination at N is one level, so the individual person, to what is done in your neighborhood, to what is done in your city or village, to what is done in your region, and what is done on a systemic level, uh, in the policy level. And that's the big challenge and there are some ex many examples of elements of these coordination mechanisms that work. 
but there's no example for as far as I know where everything is well coordinated, so it's always something, room for improvement, so to speak. So that's, that's uh, and it is different everywhere. The principles are the same, but how it is translated is different between people, between neighborhoods, between villages and cities, and between regions, between countries. So that's, uh, so don't think too much standardized about quality improvement and quality assurance. Thank you very much, Dr. Nisa. I took some notes, actually, just as answer. if I was your student. All right, I don't know if I'm right, but I just would like to recap a little bit because this is very, very inspiring. It's randomly, all right, mass individualization, uh, dignity, guarantee a good life, uh, well-being, culture, support, learning and improving, uh, learn from each other, and I don't have enough place to write the other ones <laughs> uh, in my paper. But thank you very much for, uh, for sharing all this with us. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thanks again, Dr. Nice. Uh, Mrs. Mark, are you with us? Are you okay? So. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, you are in Denmark. Uh, yes, be very welcome uh, 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 digitally in Belgium, all right? Um, we know. We know, just as Sweden in a previous workshop, but we know that Denmark has a great experience, of course, in care services. Uh, your country is implementing a project aimed at integrating mental health services for adults. Uh, it's called the FACT model. So, uh, Mrs. Mark, could you please briefly explain what is it concretely and flag the key success factors in adapting the facts models to the local context? Yes, I will. Thank you. The project is supported by the European Commission's technical support instrument. The purpose of the project is to create multidisciplinary, cross-sectoral teams to deliver integrated mental health care. The target group is the most vulnerable citizens with severe mental illness. These citizens do not care about boundaries between sectors. They just want coherent care that matches their needs. But they are often lost in a gap between sectors and do not get the support they need. And many of them don't have relatives who can help prevent fallout. In the project, we get expert help from the Dutch Certification Center for Act and Fact on implementing the fact model and adapting it to our local context. The FACT model is a person-centered, recovery-oriented model for integrated care. It's designed to enhance mental health services to people with severe mental illness. The model is based on six core items related to organization, to staff skills and competencies, and to the approach to the clients. The experiences from the Netherlands are that these six core items combined with model fidelity, with evidence-based practices and with recovery-oriented practices are what works. Before our professionals started to work this way, they just informed each other about their own goals and initiatives for the citizens. Now they have a mutual starting point, namely the citizens' goal, and the interventions are planned and delivered directly or indirectly with this common goal in view. <coughs> There are key success factors at more levels. At a structural level, <clears throat> the possibility for sharing data on a digital platform is a key success factor for implementing the FACT model. The Danish legislation are in some ways old-fashioned. The law reflects the time where all appointments between professionals and citizens were written with a pencil in a diary. Nowadays, we use electronic documentation systems and appointments and contact details are registered in electronic booking systems, and the frontline staff uses gadgets to stay informed about the citizens. For the law does not allow the professionals from different sectors to share information about their appointments with the citizens or on contact details digitally. So the only option they have is to share this information in paper form. And this is a big step backwards in a working day where all other kinds of communication are digital. And in order to articulate this challenge, or rather barrier, the project cooperates with a private law firm. They help us to describe that legal barrier, and our goal is to try to influence the lawmakers to modernize the legislation. At an organizational level, the decision makers' courage to reorganize services is a key success factor for implementing the FACT model. 
the professionals can improve practice in the existing setup to a certain level, but at some point, high-level management has to make their visions and ambitions for integrated care clear and set the direction for the corporation. And after a little more than two years period, project period, we are now having a good dialogue with the decision makers, and now they are willing to discuss how to make the necessary changes. At team level, the key success factors for implementing the model are related to staff skills, to approach, and to commitment. The team leaders' biggest tasks are to, first of all, ensure appropriate and sufficient professional skills and competences, and second, to empower a recovery-oriented approach to the citizens, and last but not least, to support and release the team's commitment to the model and to integrated care. And at this stage in the process where we are now, there's another success factor at team level. It is to set the right teams. Some people do not work well in a setup under construction where known things are being changed and challenged. And people who find this difficult tend to focus on structure, organization, and things that are not possible. And instead, we want them to focus on cooperation, on integrated interventions, and on finding creative solutions to the citizens' problems. We still have a lot to learn and to improve, but right now we are at a good place. The model makes sense and more details are falling into place. Our conclusion so far is that integrated care works. It gives professionals an overview of all the jigsaw puzzle pieces that have to be combined in creative ways to deliver person-centered care to citizens with severe mental illness. When the pieces are put together in a suitable way, it gets obvious for both the citizen, the relatives, and the professionals what needs to be done, why, by whom, and when. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Mark. Uh, uh, I have to tell you that we received some uh, feedbacks uh, in, uh, in Slido, and we have someone saying, wonderful that we have someone from uh, the mental health. Uh, so mm -hmm. your uh, uh, comment on this and your experience is very well appreciated here. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mark, again. And um, I would like now to ask a question to Natasha. Natasha Adobardi Muscat, you are expert on integrated care. Uh, could you please tell us, Natasha, what are the key aspects necessary to achieve an, integrative, uh, an integrated sorry, continuum on long-term care services provision and also to facilitate the integration of long-term services uh, within existing uh, health and social care systems? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Well, I definitely cannot introduce myself as an expert on integrated care. I'm the director of the Division of Country Health Policies and Systems at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And we have, of course, made integrated care, integrated health and social care a key priority of our work area going forward within the broader area of the whole healthcare system. But we see then many member states are really struggling with this because in spite of the fact that it is recognized as an important objective, we still see that there is a lot of fragmentation. And I was pleased to, to hear uh, previous speakers emphasizing the need to really put the person at the center, that it's not a one size fits all, that when we come to approach quality, it requires a very different perspective to perhaps what one would uh, carry out in an acute uh, emergency hospital setting. And I think this is all very important. As WHO, we are working uh, in this area and uh, we have identified six key system elements that we see as crucial facilitators for the integration of care services. Let me start with sustainable and fair financing. In far too many countries, there still is uh, um, not enough care financing and particularly older persons who may not have um, uh, the right pension and the right means are excluded from access to long-term care or are impoverished as a result of this. And I think this is an area where we still do not have enough data, whilst we have quite some good data when it comes, for example, to the impact of lack of access to medicines, 
Um, when it comes, for example, to the impact of lack of access to long-term care services and what this means for older persons and their dependents, this is an area where further research is important. The second element, which again has come up, is, is the workforce. And I will come to the workforce again later. And the third one, the innovation and in service delivery. In spite of all the talk on digitalization, um, the care sector is an area that can benefit far more from digitalization if we make the efforts to improve digital literacy of both care workers and of older persons who tend to be the prime beneficiaries. But many times um, when we come even to focus, for example, digital skills, we focus very much on, on people who are in employment and we forget about the beneficiaries, for example, of, of care. And then, of course, I think um, the governance, the information, the monitoring, those are generally the systemic levers that have to be in place. But if I have to prioritize, I would say financing, workforce and innovation in service delivery. I won't have time to go into detail on everything also because uh, I'm running late and have to jump off at one o'clock to take another call. But I'll just go perhaps to share a few more thoughts with you. In terms of alignment, I think we can do far better between the health and care sector when it comes to alignment of needs assessment frameworks. We can't continue to work in silos and actually um, push ourselves onto the persons requiring care by sending a lot of individual practitioners all carrying out their own assessment. This is not going to be sustainable in the long term because we have gaps in the care workforce, but it's also not working for people and for integration. Secondly, primary health care. In the aftermath of the pandemic, um, we realized that those uh, countries that were able to withstand the impact of the pandemic better had better functioning, better integrated primary health care systems. But even primary health care itself is changing and we need to have this extra step where we better network our primary health care with mental health services and with long-term care services. Far too often, these links are not sufficiently well established. And the third uh, point is when it comes to entitlements. In many countries, we still see big, big differences in harmonization of entitlements between the health and long-term care sectors. And uh, people basically fall in, in the gaps, in the cre crevices that are created. I was pleased to hear um, a focus on quality. We have a new quality of care office working in Greece to support Greece and neighboring countries. And we have identified that quality of long-term care is one of the areas where there are still gaps and far more work needs to be done for all the good reasons that have been elaborated by the previous speakers. But also another challenge that we find when we come to care is that the responsibility, so I spoke about harmonization of entitlements, that's kind of from a horizontal perspective if you wish, but we also need to look at the vertical perspective and we find that responsibilities for health and for care are often organized at different levels in countries and this in itself also creates difficulties and barriers to access even if no barriers actually exist legally on paper, the system becomes complex to navigate because they are dealing with different authorities, municipal versus regional versus national. And sometimes there isn't a clear delineation of responsibilities and the persons needing care and their informal carers really have to jump through many hoops in order to access the system. Earlier on, I touched upon the health workforce, and this is the key point that I would like to make. We launched a report at our regional committee in Tel Aviv a few weeks ago, a flagship report on the state of the health and care workforce in Europe. So we are always referring to the health and care workforce in Europe, but in reality, if you look at the report, you will see that we only have data on six major groups of professionals, all of whom fall very much with the exception perhaps of nursing in the health rather than the care sector. So when we come to the care sector, we don't really have the data and what cannot be measured cannot be planned, forecasted and managed. Having said that, we do know that we are facing vast shortages, that as a continent, the European region is dependent increasingly 
on importing care workers from other parts of the world. And this, of course, raises also important ethical issues for WHO as we go forward. And whilst not wanting to sound too negative, I have to raise the alarm that what we have is a stagnating formal care workforce. This is also associated with the demography that we have in Europe, where we do have um, a smaller pool of younger people who are also opting to work in very different areas and not necessarily in the care sector. At the same time as we also see a contraction of informal care resources because people have less children and people who are working are being asked to work for longer. Furthermore, we are seeing that it is becoming very difficult also to retain the current care workforce because of all the issues around their mental health and well-being. And here I have a clarion call, let us please invest in supporting the mental health and well-being of our care for workforce first and foremost, because this is under-recognized. We give them gloves, we give them personal protective equipment, we give them masks in order to protect them, but we haven't thought about how do we protect actually their mental health and well-being. Many of our care workers are not even working in an organized environment where they have peer support, but many of them work very much on their own in people's homes. And this obviously has a burden also and at all on their mental health. Finally, let me say how Thank delighted you, we Natasha, are. I have to ask you to office. shorten a little to, bit. Yes, yes, I am just close now to say My that apology we are for this, very but delighted we are running just out of time. To, so if you could to be just summarize working. in one minute, please. Yes, to be working with you on the European care strategy going forward, and we're very much looking forward to this promising collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Natasha. You. Thank you very much for sharing, sharing all this. Uh, we, we have to keep time also for uh, the question and answers, so uh, it's time for that now. Uh, so the people online, you can post your, your uh, questions on the Slido, and we're going to start with the room. If anybody here has a question, you can raise your hand. Yes, we're going to give you a mic over there on the first row. We are listening to you. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Josien Hofs. I'm representing the International Federation of Social Workers. And uh, what we experience is that there are quite some initiatives uh, based on communities as we speak of uh, long-term care. And uh, we think as social workers that this is a really interesting development and maybe we can involve more community, in, uh, more community involvement in long-term care because people are living in a community, the, uh, their uh, supporters live in a community, and as soon as someone uh, needs more care, it's lifted out of that community. Who wants to, to, to react to this? What, what, what could be your feedback about this? Yes, yes, Philippe, please. Uh, I, I, I love the feedback because one of the things that I, I put here is that we need more different professions in long-term care, and social work is one that uh, I, I, I put down. I mean, it does exist in community-based care. There's no reason why social workers shouldn't go in all forms of care, shouldn't have a role in all forms of care, because care systems are built from a medical perspective, but not from a social inclusion perspective, not from a perspective of learning, of uh, fulfillment, of development of, uh, of, of a person's personality, because at any age you want to learn, at any age you want to do things, at any age you want to meet people, and this is not sufficiently present uh, for, for many people in, 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 in need for care, either because they have reduced mobility or because they are in segregated settings which are not part of life, and uh, of, of, sorry, the, the life of wider society. Um, another thing that I want to, to highlight earlier is that there is um, ageism in the way we think this systems. Um, if you think how care for older persons is organized, and uh, I, I noted that Ms. Azopadi Muscat said most of users of long-term care are older persons, but they're not all older persons. And when they're not older persons, we call them persons with disabilities and we give them different kinds of services and support. And you can have services such as access to a, I don't know, a, a wheelchair or things like that, which suddenly become unavailable because you cross a certain age threshold. For the moment, we don't have a non-discrimination framework on age. Uh, 
in access to goods and services, and this uh, has been proposed by the Commission in 2008. And I thank the Commission. I mean, uh, you are here, but the Commission at its whole for not dropping it, because every year we read the Commission work program and we, we look at the directive. Um, but we, we are happy that it's still there, that it's still being debated, uh, because member states don't want it and are talk it down and, and, and postpone it and postpone it. And it has been more than 10 years since this has been um, proposed, and there's no movement. But this is one of the sectors where we see that there's clearly a need to say age discrimination is not acceptable, because it in this specific case, it, um, it uh, reduces person's health, it reduces person's life expectancy, it reduces uh, person's participation in life, and, and this is a very clear example of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you. Uh, Flaviana, we're going back to you, but we have a question and we would like to give a voice also to the people who are online. We have a question for you, Dr. Nice. Uh, uh, this is said, Dr. Nice uh, highlights needs for mass individuali individualization of support. Is that possible in large centers, such as, for example, nursing homes, which by definition, standardize. What yeah. could you tell us very quickly? Yeah, there's no opposition between standardization and uh, not making individualization. So if you look at the, the, the Amazon or the type of companies, they provide pr sort of individu individualized service, but they have a standardized process. But the client, the person doesn't notice it or doesn't So there is no contradiction between that? It could go together. And I think it's very important to allow exceptions. Every person is exceptional and is an exception for, and, and deviates from the average. Uh, so it sh he or she should be, uh, so you should be able as a care worker or as a professional to make uh, an exception for someone, provided that you have a good reason for that and you have a good agreement on that. And if an organization allows exceptions, they can standardize a lot because many people can have standardized processes, but you can make differences. Uh, but being allowing exceptions is a very important way of making a culture, a learning culture, an improving culture, which is person-centered. And uh, so I think it, it, it is possible. It is possible. Okay. Thank you very and much. We, we've seen examples. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nies. Thank you very much. Uh, Flaviana, time flies. Uh, we should probably need 10 more workshops about that, but we don't have time right now to do that. But I would like, of course, to give you uh, uh, um, the mic for um, a short conclusion. And once again, what, what are the learnings? What are your personal learnings? I know it's a lot because we spoke about a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, let's say in three, two, three keywords, what could you share with us as a conclusion? I will rebel myself against <laughs> 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 your request. I'm mean, tapping two, three words, but two, three ideas indeed. Okay. Uh, and I'm happy to do it and I'm very grateful actually for what I've heard. So I think that the main idea that I distilled from, from a lot of your feedback was is this idea of a paradigm shift. That, uh, that we see happening and that we have to keep sort of pushing for. Uh, moving from this administrative bureaucratic logic to the biological needs logic to the safety first logic as you were saying to really the opposite to, to a culture of empowerment to a culture in which persons co-create quality I mean persons in need of care co-create quality because they understand quality in their own individual ways together with the service providers they have the autonomy they are entitled to choice and all, all in all, this is person-centeredness. So that would be one string, you know, that I, uh, that would be my, my, my takeaway. The second, um, I haven't thought about it before. The panel is really this idea of organizational and culture and the needed organizational culture in, uh, in uh, long-term care facilities, uh, and the need for champions. Uh, and for models where, you know, uh, digitalization is used as its best potential, as, as Dorte was, uh, was showing, and where really uh, it's okay to make mistakes and to learn from, from them. So, uh, so this, um, this is another uh, uh, takeaway. And thirdly, on the idea of integration, and this is something that Natasha has touched upon in quite some, some, some detail, it's true that sometimes healthcare and uh, social 
care and long-term care run in parallel as opposed to in tandem. So we really have to, to look at this horizontal fragmentation and at the same time see how the vertical uh, uh, fragmentation uh, can, be, can be improved so that things are really more seamless and you don't have a patchwork of policy areas even more fragmented by, um, by a vertical distribution, so regional, national, and local. So that would be my third main uh, yeah, takeaway from you. this. Thank many you very thanks. much. Many thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Flaviana. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so it's now time to conclude, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very big uh, thank you for uh, attending this uh, workshop. Thank you very much, dear experts, for being with us. Uh, Mrs. Mark, thank you very much for being with us from uh, Denmark. Uh, we really appreciate. Uh, I really would like to thank everybody. And we also have to name some people who prepared all this. I'm talking about Susanna. I'm talking about Catherine. I'm talking about Diana. Those people did a wonderful job for that. So thank you. They are part of the preparation team. That was a huge work. And of course, thank you very much for, uh, to the technical team, which is over there, and to the translator. Uh, very good job. Great job. Thank you. See you very soon. Take care. Have fun. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>